to, uh, I wanted to thank the good folks of the Skadumfa Public Library and, uh, and Rebecca Recor for having me down here today. Uh, I was here towards the end of last year and spoke to the genealogy group and uh, we had, seemed to have a nice time that day. Uh, I wanted to point out my fellow main author, uh, Captain Perkins, is here today. I, I greatly appreciate that. He's a, he's a good author in his own right, and, uh, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, as Becky said, my first book, uh, Mainers on the Titanic, has been published by Downey's Books, the same good folks who published Downey's Magazine. And uh, we've added a, another layer to today's presentation. You all have uh, boarding passes. You have tickets with your name on them. And what I do in my book talk is I tell the story of Titanic sinking through the people of Maine who were aboard. So most of you will probably hear a name. And if you don't, at the end, you can ask about the person you are. And I believe there's going to be a chart that will tell at least if you survived or perished uh, in the sinking. <laughs> Today is a, it's a kind of a special day. It's April 16th, 2019, and 107 years ago, the way the calendar works, it was also a Tuesday. Uh, April 16th, the day before, on April 15th, at about 2.20 a.m., Titanic had sank in the North Atlantic, claiming 1,500 people, roughly. Now, the morning of April 15th, and as the day went out, wireless messages were coming in all day long. So the headlines that Mainers were reading in their newspapers were that everybody aboard Titanic was safe, that Titanic had not sunk, and that she was being towed to Halifax. So on the evening of the 15th, Mainers went to bed thinking there had been a problem, but everything was right with the world because Titanic was unsinkable. And uh, now, exactly a hundred years ago today, the, the truth was out, the headlines were much different, and it was a hundred years ago to the day that the enormity of the tragedy started to sink in for the people of Maine and the people of the world. And it led to basically three days of an agonizing wait for the people back in Maine, because the only thing coming from Carpathia, the only rescue ship, was the names of the survivors, and they were coming in slowly, and every edition of the newspaper would have an updated list, but there were no details, and there were many errors in that uh, survivor list, uh, and people were really just waiting for Carpathia to arrive on Thursday to truly find out if their loved one had truly died or survived. And I'm going to tell you about these people who were from Maine. And I'm going to start with Helen Churchill Candy, who was a divorced author of York, Maine, who was in her 50s. She was sailing on Titanic to come back to America because her son had been injured in an airplane accident, which was quite new for the time. Helen Churchill Candy would be befriended by Edward A. Kent of Bangor, who was a very successful architect, and Mr. Kent was traveling back to America to retire. And they would form this little group of about six or seven people who would basically be together through the entire voyage. They'd play bridge, they'd have dinner together, they would do all the things aboard the ship. And uh, Mrs. Candy gave a description of Titanic. Uh, one morning she left her cabin early, planning to explore the ship on her own. She was impressed by the ship's personality, her spirit. Candy called a Titanic a monarch of the seas, whose indifference to mankind was significant in its utter self-absorption. Quote, it was only at the bow that I could appreciate her pride in her size. How grand she was, how sophisticated. I was sure she liked her name. It suited her. Titanic, the biggest ship afloat. Now, the night that uh, Titanic hits the iceberg, Mrs. Candy and Mr. Kent and their group are in the dining room, and it's getting late, and it's getting very cold. And uh, Mrs. Candy 
suddenly realizes she's the only female in this group and she's a little self-conscious and decides to go back to her cabin and she asks her steward to pour her a hot bath because she thinks it will, will warm her up a little bit. And she's holding on to a wooden post in her cabin when the ship hits the iceberg. And she said if she hadn't been holding that post, she would have been thrown to the floor. Uh, she quickly goes into the hallway, and it's deserted and quiet, but the lights are burning the brightest she's ever seen them, and it's eerie. And suddenly her steward comes running up the stairs. She asks what's wrong, and he says, there's nothing wrong, you just need to go back to bed, and he runs off which left her a little more unsettled than if he had actually told her the truth. And this leads us to a situation where things on the ship are, they, they seem okay, but they just don't seem quite right. And there were a few other mainers. Uh, there was Henry Sleeper Harper, who was aboard with his wife, his manservant, and uh, his dog. And Mr. Harper actually owned an island in Frenchman's Bay off Mount Desert Island. This was a time of um, unprecedented wealth. And Mr. Harper and his entire party, including the dog, would, uh, would escape the ship uh, unharmed. Uh, there was the Spedden family, and there was a gentleman who has Douglas Spedden's name. Um, it, this was Mr. and Mrs. Spedden, and their young son, Douglas. And uh, Douglas was six years old at the time of the sinking. The Spedans, along with their servants, would basically come up from their cabin and basically walk on a lifeboat and have a very good experience as far as Titanic goes. But it would be three years later, uh, down in Winter Harbor, where they lived, uh, Douglas Spedden would actually be killed in the first Motor, uh, motor vehicle accident in the state of Maine. So though they had a charmed experience on Titanic, fate found them, as fate would do with most of the survivors of Titanic. Then the, another person was William Sloper. He was of Greenville and of Connecticut. He was the son of a, a wealthy banker, and he was, he was carousing aboard Titanic. He was in his early 20s, and and I can't blame him. Uh, he would seem to have a blessed experience himself. He would walk on a lifeboat. He would get off without any injury. But the day after Carpathia arrives in New York, a New York newspaper owned by William Randolph Hearst would identify on its front page Mr. Sloper as being the man who escaped Titanic dressed as a woman. <laughs> And uh, things have been okay, but not okay. But, and then they start to get a little more not okay. And there's a woman running around almost in circles on the deck, uh, screaming and crying, and she would faint. Her name was Bess Allison, and the crew members picked her up and got her off, got, got her uh, someplace else. But Bess Allison and her husband, their family came from Old Orchard Beach. And they had two children, Lorraine, who was three, and Trevor, who was one. And um, when the ship hits the iceberg, the nanny has Trevor in her room, and she goes next door and knocks on Mr. and Mrs. Allison's door and says there's danger and we need to get to a lifeboat. And they tell her she's crazy and she needs to go back to bed. Well, she takes Trevor and goes up and gets off on one of the first lifeboats launched. <coughs> And by the time Mr. and Mrs. Allison realize the danger, uh, Mrs. Allison will not get on a lifeboat until she can find her son Trevor, who's already uh, a, quite a ways away from Titanic in safety. Their daughter Lorraine would be the only child from first class who would perish in the sinking. And then things, things really start to go downhill. And this is symbolized by a boat that would be called the Millionaire's Lifeboat. And what happens is, one of the first boats that was to be launched was to have aboard it several prominent people from Mount Desert Island. This included young Madeline Astor and her husband. It included the Thayers, the Wideners, the uh, 
Ryerson's, and one other party. Nope, that's it. Um, and they were taken to this lifeboat, which should have been first launched. But Titanic had a new invention. Her sister ship Olympic, who had been, which had been launched a year or two before, on their A deck, uh, if people were promenading around the deck, sea spray would come in the first few windows. So Titanic decided to have glass put in those first few windows. So they, they lower this lifeboat down. All these millionaires are waiting, but the, the glass is there. They can't get through. So they send a seaman to get a tool to open that glass. And the crew proceeds to launch the lifeboats back and back and back. By the time they get back to this original lifeboat, the ship has almost sunk. It's 20 minutes before the actual sinking. The ship that was 70 feet above water, uh, that boat was 70 feet above water. Now it's only 20 feet above water. And these uh, millionaires, the wives, they take a deck chair and try to use it as a stairway into the lifeboat because of the list of the ship is holding that last lifeboat away from the ship. Some women and children had to be thrown into that lifeboat. Uh, the lifeboat is launched the 20 feet it has to go to get to the water. And as I say, by now things are quite chaotic. Um, and people that are left on the deck are throwing barrels and life chairs or deck chairs and anything they can find into the water. Because by now there are there's people in the water too. And this little boat is dodging all that. There's water coming out of the pump that's threatening to flood it before they get away from the side of the ship. And these women of society are rowing and they are uh, heaving water over the side. They're doing everything they can to save their own lives. And uh, now, as we all know, <coughs> the ship does sink. Um, and in one of the lifeboats was Dr. Alice Leader, who was a physician from Lewiston. And this is a quote from her. No one can realize the agony of those minutes when the screams and cries for succor from those who had been swept from the decks into the sea were borne to our ears by the ice-cold breeze of the night. Never so long as the good God permits me to live will I ever forget those cries. And then the cries go silent. And she says, as the prayers and screams for help ceased, we all knew what it meant. Death had relieved them of their agony and suffering. Now, on the, uh, these lifeboats, there are about 18 lifeboats on the open sea. They're in the middle of the Atlantic, and it's dark, and it's frigidly cold. And uh, there, are, there are bodies, and flotsam, and jetsam all amongst them. And, and some of these lifeboats are not very full. Some are way packed, way more packed than they should be. And you have people who have just seen their entire families wiped away and that are hysterical and your life depends on the momentary sanity of the person next to you and it was and these boats would be on this water for between two and four hours before Carpathia would come to rescue them. Now there was one woman, there were two women in one of the boats Clara Hayes and Orion Davidson. Now Clara was married to uh, Charles Melville Hayes. Mr. Hayes was president of the Grand Trunk Railroad out of Portland. And the Grand Trunk was seen as one of the major shaping forces of what Portland was at the turn of the century and can be credited for what Portland is now, which is a thriving city. And um, Mrs. Hayes and her daughter had been put on the lifeboat by their husbands, uh, Charles Hayes and then Thornton Davidson. Now, Mr. Hayes was traveling back to America to, he was also going to be retiring from the Grand Trunk Railroad. He and his wife had lived for years on Cushing Island, a private island off the coast of Portland, and they had built sort of a dream retirement home. And, uh, and that's where they were headed. Mr. Hayes thought there was no real danger, and his daughter said that that she and her mother didn't even think of kissing the, their menfolk goodbye. And after the ship is sunk and everybody's in the lifeboats, Clara Hayes 
continually calls out into the darkness, Charles Hayes, are you there? And she would never get an answer. Uh, also, uh, there was the Thayer family. Mrs. Thayer was on the millionaire's boat. Mr. Thayer did not make it. Uh, but they had a young son named Jack Thayer, who was 18, 17 or 18 at the time of the sinking. The entire Thayer family was headed to that millionaire's boat. And as I said, this was towards the end of the sinking. Um, a group of people just, there was a wall of people that sort of cut their little party in half. And Jack would never see his father again. He was separated from his parents. And uh, so young Mr. Thayer's alone, and he finally just, the lifeboats are all gone, and he jumps into the water. Now there's one lifeboat that couldn't be launched. It just sort of slid off Titanic when she sank, and it was overturned. And on top of this overturned lifeboat were about 30 men and one woman, one woman. And one of these men was young Jack Thayer. And these men, throughout the night, if you fell into the water, it meant certain death. And these men were fighting for life. They had to fight their way away from the rest of the people that were in the water. And the sea was very calm when Titanic sank. But as the sun was starting to come up, the, the, uh, the, the uh, waves started coming in. It, was, it got a little more treacherous. And what was happening is every time the water would ripple, this lifeboat would move a little bit, and a little air would come out from underneath it, and it would sink a little bit more. So the men and the one woman, they organized into two, two rows of single file people, and they all stood with their hands on the uh, shoulders of the person in front of them. And the two people in the very front, as a wave would come, they would try to all shift at the same time to try to mitigate the loss of air from under the uh, lifeboat when, when the water got choppy. <clears throat> now, Carpathia is in the, is, makes her way home and Titanic sank early Monday morning. Ty uh, Carpathia comes in Thursday night at about 9 o'clock in the middle of a thunderstorm and it's raining and the ship's coming into port and there's tens of thousands of people in New York awaiting Carpathia. And on shore, on, on the pier waiting, one person was J.P. Morgan of Northeast Harbor. J.P. Morgan basically owned Titanic. And uh, he, a lot of blame would be laid at his feet. Uh, and Mr. Morgan actually lost a lot of good friends in the crew and in the passengers aboard Titanic. And uh, he would spend the last year, he would live for almost exactly a year. He died almost a year to the day after Titanic sank as an older man. And uh, he would spend that year just being blamed and feeling pretty bad about things. But he had the courage to be on the pier when Carpathia came in. And also waiting on the pier were two relatives of the White family. Uh, Percival and Richard White were from Brunswick. Richard was a student at Bowdoin College. And Richard was a very serious, dedicated person. And he had actually finished his studies a semester early. And he and his father were going to come back to Maine, and Richard was going to participate in the graduation exercises. But uh, Percival's reward for his son's hard work was a ticket aboard Titanic. Um, their names would not appear on the survivor list, but at the, after Titanic sank, there was not much news coming in. So the state's newspapers did publish the passenger list. Well, there was a mistake on the passenger list with the Whites, too. They had combined two parties of, with the name of White. So it was Mr. and Mrs. White, their son, their servants. So the, Mrs. White, Richard's mother, did not know what to think. Uh, and she had two sons, Richard and then Percival Jr. And uh, Richard was very special to her. He was the youngest. Um, I interviewed a descendant of the family, 
And Percival Jr. was, he was a bit of a cad. Richard was a very serious person, and the mother was very close to him. Now, of course, Percival and Richard do not come off Carpathia. So Mrs. White sends out letters to all the first-class survivors with four simple questions asking if they had, if anybody had seen the father and son, and had they sent home messages or anything? And they sent along pictures of each of the men. And she would get several responses. It would turn out that Richard and Percival were helping load that last boat, the millionaire's lifeboat that contained Mrs. Astor and everybody. There was one woman who had her elderly mother on that lifeboat. She said before they boarded, Percival Sr. had a bottle of wine and handed it to those two ladies, and they each took a little snort off it. And she credited that wine and, and Mr. White's generous act as keeping her mother alive through that cold, frigid night before Carpathia rescued them. Um, and then there's a, just a few other names to mention. One is Reverend Charles Leonard Kirkland of the Old Town Bangor area. Uh, Reverend Kirkland was a Baptist minister. He had no specific church. He would fill in wherever he was needed. He had married young in life and had nine children. Three of them died in, I believe, the A flu epidemic, the flu epidemic um, in the late 1800s. And his wife would die young, too. Um, Reverend Kirkland's family did not know he was aboard Titanic. He had a son named Henry who worked at Old Town Canoe, and Henry would open up the Old Town Enterprise, the newspaper for that area, and in this passenger list that they had printed to fill space, the, he and his siblings would see their father's name, Reverend Charles Leonard Kirkland. None of that family went up to Halifax to try to identify Reverend Kirkland. They sent a photograph of their father to the chief of police up there to see if the police chief might identify him. Yeah, he never was identified. Then the last person I'm going to mention is, his name was Victor Verescu. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but he was a wool, a woolen, a wool, a mill worker, a woolen mill worker in Basselboro. And he had gone to Europe to take care of some family business, and his family would find out the same way that he was aboard Titanic. They would see his name in the newspaper. <coughs> He was the only third-class passenger from Maine that I identified. And what I've just told you about him is all I know about him. He's a very good example of Maine history that's being lost to time. Because they were just, uh, none of these people are alive, even the survivors. The families are, are gone or going. And uh, you just hate to see someone who went through an experience be lost to uh, time. It's kind of sad. Now, also in the book, I have a chapter telling what happened to the survivors, and that's where some of the more interesting stories are. Um, not many of the survivors really had a good existence after Titanic sank. It's almost like fate was, had allowed them a little extra time, but not much. Um, there's an interesting story about uh, Carpathia comes in Thursday night. That Friday was Patriot's Day. Normally, there are not newspapers printed throughout the state on Patriot's Day. But because the world had been waiting for information, and because this was such an enormous thing, the, uh, the big city newspaper swang into action. And there's a very interesting, the Lewiston Evening Journal tells the story of how they put that special edition together. And there's a little bit about how the Bangor Daily News put theirs together, I believe, or the Portland that's sort of an interesting side note. Um, there were there were some companies at Maine in Maine that traded on the disaster to advertise their product. There's a few pages about that. Um, and there's there's an I find it a very interesting chapter about Halifax, Nova Scotia, because uh, Halifax sent out a ship, the McKay Bennett to try and recover whatever bodies they could recover from the Atlantic. <coughs> all in all, I think under 400 of the 1,500 people that perished were recovered. Um, 
the city of Halifax really turned out. Uh, the family members of people from Maine went to Halifax to either claim a body if it had been identified or to try to <coughs> identify a body from the un unidentified people. Uh, and that, it just, it's a heartbreaking chapter. And I've already talked to a few people that were up, that have been up to Halifax. They really embrace their role in history. So I, there's a few pages in there about that. And I tell you, if, if that doesn't make you choke up, nothing will. Um, and basically, that's it for my general talk. I'd like to turn it over now to see if there are any questions about my book, about Titanic in general, about historic research, or about the name on your uh, boarding pass, if you'd like to ask. So I will open it up to questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, did White Star, the, the shipping line, White Star, did they pay any um, for the, the, the pass, not that you could replace all that money, sure. but if, uh, probably for the first class passengers, but what about the people in steerage and everything? Were they ever given anything for that? What happened was uh, there was a, a lawsuit and I've looked through those records. Um, there was Percival White from Brunswick. His widow actually provided an inventory of what Percival had aboard when he went on the ship. Uh, Percival White was a he was a list maker, and uh, a bunch of families sued and won. But the way the law was written, the only thing they were entitled to was what was left of Titanic, which was about 16 lifeboats, so the value of those lifeboats and the money collected for the set of tickets for that first voyage. So uh, the families of all these people had to split, I'm going to say roughly $20,000 in, I mean it wasn't much, it was a pittance, it was a bit of an insult. White Star, Star would send bills to the crew members' families for the loss of their uniforms. Uh, yeah. And it should, it's worth noting that the White Star Managing Director was Bruce Ismay, and I told you about the Millionaire's Lifeboat, the last to be launched. Bruce Ismay was basically on the next to last to be launched at a time when crew members literally were linking arms to keep men from getting in this lifeboat just to get the last of the women and children in. And he would sort of jump in. He'd been helping uh, fill the lifeboat. So White Star did not have a big heart. I think it's very safe to say. And, and that's what happened as far as a lawsuit and any money went. So, yeah. What was the cost on the first class ticket? Boy, uh, I know I don't. Yeah, she has a, Becky has a copy of one, and I know there's a, they've just recently announced that there's a submarine that you can, you're going to be able to take to go to Titanic, and the cost is the, roughly the cost of what a first class ticket would have been. Okay, um, I've been to some other exhibits um, at the Titanic, and this is one from Ireland, the last place they left, and it says, First class ticket at that time was 870 pounds, or today, or in dollars at that time, it was $4,350. Today, that would be worth $69,600 wow. in a first class. Uh, there was, um, that's a parlor suite. Um, and then down to uh, third class, um, the cost then would have been eight pounds or $40 and today's money, $640, with other categories in between. You now, Titanic had been updated, so it was as if the third class accommodations were basically as nice as what had previously been considered second class. So everything was a little nicer, but the price was there. For third class, it was a lot of people coming to America to start a new life. So White Star got their cut of that American dream. And uh, you've had your hand up. I was just curious, what happened to the capsized lifeboat you know, the people were trying to? Sure. Um, I'm going to assume it finally sank. What happens is one of those lifeboats actually had a sail set up in it. So when Carpathia comes into view, uh, this lifeboat with the sail 
actually goes back to pick up the people on that upturned lifeboat. So they did all survive. The lifeboat itself, I assume, was left there and probably sunk. Uh, all those people did make it onto Carpathia. It's in, the way I read between the lines, that <coughs> lifeboat didn't go back until they did see Carpathia. It's not like everybody was rushing to get to this lifeboat to rescue these people. These were some overcrowded lifeboats, and trying to save someone's life could mean the loss of everyone in that lifeboat. One of the men on that upturned lifeboat was First Officer Lightoller, and he had a whistle, and uh, he continually blew the whistle to try to get everybody else's attention, and no one came back until boat number 14 when Carpathia arrived. Now, Mrs. Astor survived, but Mr. Astor did not, is that correct? That's correct. And Mrs. Astor was pregnant, wasn't she? She was pregnant, and uh, I, you know, uh, I love the Astor story. Uh, Mrs. Astor, I'm going to just briefly tell it. Mrs. Astor was 19. Colonel Astor was in his 40s. Colonel Astor was recently divorced, and Madeline caught his eye on the uh, <clears throat> tennis courts down on Mount Desert Island in Bar Harbor. <clears throat> and now, and he would propose to her, she would accept, but no church in the country would perform the ceremony because divorce was quite scandalous back then. And the age difference was just freaking everybody out. <laughs> so finally, Colonel Astor had to make a $1,000 donation to a church in Newport, Rhode Island. And that minister uh, agreed to do the ceremony. What happened was Colonel Astor's mother was the queen of society. And she had passed on a year or two before this. She coined the term the 400 because the ballroom in the Astor Mansion in New York held 400 people. So if you were invited to the New Year's Eve ball, if you were one of those 400, you were in the cream of the crop for New York society. Well, Colonel Astor decided to hold the ball with Madeline hosting it after they got married, and no one responded. Everybody turned their back. So he thought if they go to Europe for the winter, they come back, she's kind of sweet, you know, walk right in. Um, now, of course, she gets on board the ship, and she's pregnant. And it's still a little bit of a secret, but she knows what they've gone through to get married. Uh, the, the, our newspapers in the state, they were merciless towards them. And you'll find plenty of examples in the book. Um, the big question that summer was, is Madeline Astor coming back to Bar Harbor? Um, and the other big thing was everybody wanted a picture of the son after he was born in August. And when Madeline Astor would step out onto these uh, country club uh, tennis uh, places, great crowds would form outside. I mean, just huge crowds. Everybody wanted to get a look at this woman, and everybody, uh, there was a big fight to get a picture of that baby. There was a big fight. Um, yeah, this, oh, this, her story ends just so great in Bar Harbor in 1917. I'm going to leave it right at that. I'm going to tell you. She did, I, this is the teaser. She did something in the middle of Bar Harbor in 1917 that was so scandalous it would mark the last of her ever being in Bar Harbor. It's all <laughs> um, she has a, her story is very fascinating, and I'm, I'm teasing here a little. I will say she's another one. She would die in her early 40s. She's another one who should have had a charmed life, but she, uh, fate seemed, uh, she always sought privacy, couldn't get it. And uh, uh, Titanic was all anybody talked about, what were Colonel Astor's last minutes like. And she wouldn't get much peace in her life. So. Speaking of the Astors, my third is Miss Rosalie Godoy Astor. That, uh, that would be, she's actually, uh, she is Mrs. Astor's maid. Yeah, uh, the name Astor is on the end because she was part of that party. Oh, is that one she, she would. She was the private nurse because Mrs. Astor was five months pregnant. So yeah, and someone has a name. It's something like Set Yancy or something like that. 
That was Mr. Harper's dog who survived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to say I forgot to say the note there. So I apologize. That's my fault. And uh, yes, ma'am. She is the physician from Lewiston who uh, I, I read her passage about hearing the cries in the night, uh, the cries of people in the water. She. Um, not a lot to say about Dr. Leader. She it just taught, uh, I wrote that she went ab abroad with all these trunks and she ends up coming back to America with just a, a tin, a biscuit tin, a toothbrush, and a postcard from Carpathia. Um, she did all, she was the only one in her party. She did not have a very eventful time on on uh, Carpathia. She was a first class female, so her chances were pretty good. And I'm, 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 I'm Ryerson? What's that? Emily Ryerson. 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 She was the young daughter of the Ryerson people. Mr. Ryerson was a founder of the Mount Desert Island Reading Room where you could get a drink during the time of prohibition. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Mr. Ryerson would die. Uh, but he had a son who was about 10 years old, and everybody's at this millionaire's lifeboat, the last to be launched, and there's a 10-year-old son by the name of Ryerson, and Lightoller, the first officer, is not going to let this boy on. The story goes that Colonel Astor found a straw hat on the deck, put it on the boy's head, and said, now you're a girl, you can get on the ship. Things I think were very tense at that mm -hmm. at that last uh, lifeboat, understandably so. So even though he was ten years old and a child, they were not going to let him on because he was male. Light taller seemed to have a particular attitude, especially as you get towards the end of the sinking. He begrudgingly let the ten-year-old boy on, and then said no more males. So, and uh, so yeah, yeah. And, yes. Was there a ship? Yes, there was the McKay Bennett was the primary ship that was sent out of Halifax. Then there were two others. There were so many bodies that they had to send two other ships out to collect to collect bodies. Um, I think all in all, about 400 bodies were found. That leaves about 1,100 that were not. Uh, some were if so, if a body could be identified as a crew member, they were actually buried at sea. Um, after they, they recovered the body, tried to identify it and, and put it back in the water. Um, there was a lot of discussion about Colonel Astor's body when it came to Halifax. It was said that his son Vincent had secured special permission to, to get his body first. That was not substantiated. Does that answer? Yep. Could, could you tell us a little bit about the ships that picked up the survivors? Well, anything, you know, sure. And this led to a lot of confusion right after Titanic sank. A lot of people were holding out hope. There were several ships in the area that were chugging right towards that spot. But Titanic was on the other side of this 20 mile long field of ice. So ships couldn't get to them very easily. Carpathia zigzagged her way through and was able to, but. There was the Californian, which basically saw the whole sinking, but the captain kept justifying everything he saw into a non-emergent situation, until finally that one of the crewmen says, well, sir, the lights are all out now. And he said, okay, good, the ship's gone on its way. Well, the ship had sunk, so the lights were all extinguished. There was the Parisian and the Virginian, which were somewhat close, but didn't make it in time. And I talk about the Mount Temple, which came out of Portland. Her captain was well known. She was also accused of being very close by and not helping. And then Titanic's sister ship Olympic was not close by, but she was coming as fast as she could. There just wasn't time. But what happens is, is Carpathia is leaving the scene with all the survivors. People are looking and they, Californians arrived and Parisian and Virginian show up. Hope is held out that these people maybe have survivors. But it all went right down to everybody was on Carpathia 
and you either got off Carpathia or you didn't. So, so that, yeah. And ma'am? Did all the 18 lifeboats make it to safety? Uh, I found just a little bit of evidence. It's not in the book. There was one story that one of the lifeboats actually, one end of it, the rope broke or something, and it just went side, uh, you know, end on end, and everybody was dumped in right towards the end. I couldn't find substantiation to that story, so it's not in the book. But it, they all made it to safety. What happened was, if there had been enough lifeboats aboard Titanic, I wouldn't be here today. None of us would be. Um, the, sh the water was very calm, and although Titanic was listing, it was never a major list toward, until the end. They easily could have, everybody could have been in a lifeboat, and then when Carpathia comes in, the water's nice and calm, Carpathia just stops at a certain point, the lifeboats row to Carpathia, and Carpathia, with a mil military precision, plucks all these people right out of the water, Men climb up a rope ladder, women are put into a, a sling chair and pulled up, and babies are put into this canvas bag that's tied to a rope, and they would cinch the canvas bag up and they'd yank the rope up and unload the babies that way. Uh, so all of, all of those lifeboats that were launched made it to Carpathia. One was damaged when they tried to get it off the roof of the, uh, the top of the ship. And there was another one that just wasn't launched correctly and uh, didn't make it. But I don't think it had people in it. And yes, ma'am. Who was from Brunswick, Maine? And you, I heard on the Maine Public that you interviewed Lucy Salak. Is yes. she here today? Uh, she is not. She lives down in Westport, Connecticut. She's an artist. She very and a very generous woman. I knew her as a customer years ago. Oh, okay. She just it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, and it was her great grandfather Percival and his son Richard. That you've spoken about already, right? Haven't you? Or yes, yes. Yeah, his Richard's reward for studying so hard was the ticket on Titanic. So she, if that is the link to. Okay. That is, and uh, there are a few pages dedicated to that family's association with Maine. Uh, Richard's mother's family were original settlers in that area. Yeah. Uh, Lucy Salad. I found her name and address through the, uh, I think it was the Brunswick Historical Society. Sure. And I contacted her, and it turns out she's basically the family historian. So I went down to Westport, Connecticut one day and spent the day in her house. She had pulled out all the pictures, all the stuff, just tons of stuff, and was very generous with her time and her stories. So the book, you're going to find a little bit more in there about the White family. I did try to find other descendants. And as I said, history is being lost to time, and uh, so, but Lucy Salad did provide quite a bit of information. Finally. And... Was Lucy Salad a cross-dresser? Did he, put a dress on to get onto the Well, now, see, Mr. Sloper, he would write a book. The book was supposed to be the biography of his father, but it was basically an attempt to explain to people, because he was getting very bad mail, he was getting newspaper clipping, just as you would expect. Um, and then on a side note, one of the things that people would do with the survivors is you'd have a dinner party, and if you knew a survivor, you would invite them. And then you had a successful dinner party because everybody wanted to hear that story. Mr. Sloper was invited to one of these dinner parties, and the host, for a centerpiece, had put a big bowl of water with ice cubes and a little toy ship in it. So, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he would, his account, he says he, did, he says he didn't dress as a woman. He was on the ship by himself, although he was with a few other, he made friends with a few other people. He said the problem came, he was one of the first survivors, and he went immediately to a hotel room in New York, and his father and brother were there, he had promised his story to a newspaper in Connecticut. One of the Hearst reporters tried to barge into the room, and his brother tried to push him out, and it led to hard feelings. So it was a way of retribution. That reporter made up the story. Oh. I don't know. I will say that towards uh, the decks were kind of dim that night, and I think there, there were stories of men 
who might have taken a blanket and wrapped it a little more closely over them than they needed to, and perhaps got on a lifeboat that way. I don't know the, I don't know the real answer to that. I presented, I tried, I presented Mr. Slover's side, and uh, it makes for a fun teaser, but if he wasn't dressed as a woman, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. Sure. The quick one was, was there a total of 18 lifeboats, and, and should there have been more? There were, uh, there were 20 altogether. There were 16 in the davits, and then there were four on the roof of the, the bridge. Um, and they had to be specially launched, and two, I think two of them couldn't be. There, under England's regulations at the time, your lifeboat capacity was determined by square feet of the boat. So Titanic was within regulations, there just was not enough lifeboats by about half. And uh, of course one of the things to change after, for, from this was, was a lifeboat seat for every person, which makes so much sense now. And White Star Line continually said, we were within regulations, you know, but not within common sense. The second question was, when you started talking, you were talking about this woman who went into the hallway and the steward said, go back in, there's no problem, nothing's wrong. Yeah. Was it because there was no communication at the beginning or were they told to say that to passengers? There, well, there was not much communication. There was no walkie-talkie, there was nothing. I couldn't communicate with the second floor of the library if this were Titanic. It was. And everybody sort of went and did what they thought was best. A few officers had met with Captain Smith, who said, launch the lifeboats and women and children first. But one side of the ship was letting no, women, no men. The other side was letting men if they yeah. couldn't find women and children. So it was a lot of it was geography. It depended on which side of the ship you were on, if you were to make it off or not. So a lot of people acting on their own, doing what they thought was best. Captain Smith was dazed after this happened. He almost in, incoherent. I think the office, officers had to take it upon themselves to, to do what they thought best. And yes, ma'am? Who was Margaret Burns, Muddy Booms? Muddy Booms. She was, I mentioned Douglas Bedden. He was six at the time of the sinking, and he died in that. He was hit by a car three years later in Winter Harbor. Muddy Booms. That's what Douglas called his nanny. Her name was Margaret Burns, but uh, he called. He was six. He called her Muddy Wounds. Uh, <laughs> she would make it. She, uh, the entire Spedden family, made it off that ship. Douglas's mother wrote a book called Polar: The Titanic Bear, and it was the story of Titanic, but told in a way that she could give it to her son, you know, who was six or seven. At the, you know, uh, it was. It's a very charming book, but then when you know that young Doug Douglas, what happens to him, it's kind of heartbreaking. So. Um, did this sinking lead to any other naval improvements for ships besides additional um, lifeboats? I know the Coast Guard was established after because of the sinking. Um, the ships, the watertight uh, walls had to go up a little bit higher, things like that. Uh, Marconi Wireless was a brand new thing, and there were no requirements for that. The Californian, the nearest ship to Titanic, their operator had gone to bed about 10 minutes before Titanic hit the iceberg. There was nothing that said he had to be on duty. Uh, that was tightened up quite a bit. Uh, things like that. There was, there was some good that came out of it. So. Uh, yes, sir? Yes, um, excellent. Uh talk by the way. Thank you. I'm a retired cargo ship captain who spent years crossing the Atlantic mm -hmm. Ocean between New York and Europe, New York and the Mediterranean, New York and San Francisco, New York and uh, Africa, and uh, I'm a graduate of the Maine Maritime Academy. I, uh, <clears throat> I spent many, I spent over 20 years on cargo ships. And after, I, I read a lot about the Titanic, and uh, it was interesting what you said about women and children first. That's, that's correct, because they carried as much as many lifeboats as the British Board of Trade required at that time. Huh. After the sinking of the Titanic, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention started. 
And of course, like this lady was asking, um, that changed everything. Regarding carrying enough white boats for everybody on your board, and the subdivision of the ships, so that you could flood certain compartments and it may still stay afloat, as long as you can flood more than those compartments through collision or whatever. But um, the whole, and that's why they did women and children first. Like you said, there were not enough life floats on the ship. Right. Nowadays, that's largely something out of Hollywood movies because, because of the safety of life at sea convention. Men and women are assigned a lifeboat on those passenger ships. And before those ships leave port, they, they sound the ship's whistle and they bring everybody to those boat stations and take, take attendance and they have a lifeboat drill and they explain how they're going to lower the lifeboats. And you go to boat station number 12 and number 10, and you'll be a deck officer or a, a crew member at each lifeboat in command of that lifeboat. And you'll be, it's very well organized now. A lot of it has to do with the safety of life at sea convention and the International Maritime Organization, which controls ships and you know, all registries. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, some very good things came out of that. You know, it's unfortunate that it had to be that way. And I haven't had, called on people in order that they put their hands up, and I apologize. Uh, do we have any more questions? All right, I'm, uh, yes, ma'am. I just have one question. Nancy, you mentioned around the Russia or the Russian Now, Suzette Parker Russian, was that her daughter? That was the daughter, yes. And I don't know how old she was. Uh, she survived without any problem. Uh, the Ryersons were actually coming back to America because they had a son who was a Harvard student and he had been in a car accident in uh, New York or some other state. So a lot of these people were coming back for kind of sad reasons. But yeah, uh, Mrs. Ryerson survived, uh, her, son, uh, her husband, and I think it was the son of board who did not survive. So yeah. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned in the beginning that um, when you were when she named that there was only one third class passenger that, you, that was identified? Uh, there was only one third, one, uh, there was one third class passenger from Maine, uh, Mr. Verescu, yeah. But were there other, of the survivors? Yeah, uh, there were, they were actually third class, they lost the greatest amount of people, but more third class passengers made it than than, this, than you might think. Uh, he was the only third class passenger from Maine that I, that I came across. All the other people, other than Reverend Kirkland, were first class passengers. Reverend Kirkland was second class. And I don't know if the families were just more prominent so there was more news coverage, but I exhaustively researched all the state's newspapers that are held uh, in the catalog in, at Folkler Library in Orono. So. I feel that I, anybody associated with me, I was able to find out about. It, so, uh, yes, ma'am. Are you aware of any connection between the Ryerson you referred to and Ryerson University in Toronto, in Canada? You know, I don't know of an association, but there may well be. I tried to focus right in on uh, any main connection, but it's quite possible. Thank it's quite you. Possible. Yep. And yes, ma'am. When you're talking about the third class passengers, are you basically saying that the percentage of third class passengers that survived was far less than your second or first class, and why was that? Yes, uh, third class uh, did very badly. Yes, the, just the way the ship was built, the lifeboats just, they just happened to be up on the top deck, but they were. Uh, third class was not allowed by law to come to second or first class areas. So by nature, it was taking them a while to just get past that to start to come up to the deck. There were physical barriers, and the lower down you went in the ship, the more like a maze it was. Some people, a lot of people didn't speak English, and of course the signs were all in English that pointed to uh, different things. There was a group that actually had to climb up a cargo crane and kind of jump across onto the first class uh, area. I mean, it, it just, there were a number of reasons that that number was so low. Uh, a large, a relatively large percentage of crew members survived Titanic. Uh, they just did. 
So, so. Um, yes, ma'am. I heard there was wonderful support in Halifax. Yes. For the families that were waiting for news and everything. Yep. Can you talk about that a little? Yep. They uh, there was a I think it was a curling ring they called it. Uh, and that was converted into a morgue. It was an iced in area. That was a morgue, and they used some of the rooms for the people to wait who were there to identify people. Uh, they had nurses and doctors there. And all through the city, had flags, flags were at half mast, and church bells were tolling. They put up uh, black sheets around the shipyard where the McKay Bennett was coming in with the dead bodies. Uh, just so they weren't gawkers. And uh, people just seemed to show respect to the people from, the, from America who were there to, to claim bodies or try to identify bodies. Uh, I tried to lay it out really nicely in that chapter about Halifax. It was worth mentioning. <clears throat> yes, sir? I'm just wondering, the Titanic rescue or whatever by Halifax, did that directly tie into the huge explosion that happened in Halifax. The there, there was no connection there, but what had happened that I believe the explosion happened before Titanic. No. And so what happened was they were at the Halifax explosion, hundreds of people were killed for the people that don't know about it. It they were prepared for a mass casualty situation like that. Uh, it just so happened that it was a ship from Halifax. It had nothing to do with the explosion, but because of the explosion, that city was prepared was prepared for this large influx of, of dead bodies. The invaders during that. Yes, there's a Christmas. What did they send a Christmas tree? Right, they did all yeah. sorts of things. Uh, Coast of Boston. Coast of Boston. Boston. They had a Boston too, yeah. right? Yeah, there was the explosion and which caused a tsunami, which are a localized tsunami, and the next day there was a blizzard. And so all these houses were blown off, gone, and the next day it's just snowing, and I mean it was, the little bit I've read about it, it was horrific, just horrific. Now, yes, sir? First of all, the, the Halifax explosion occurred in 1918, I think. Okay, so, so it, was, it was many years after it would happen, okay. when a French munition ship was hit and blew up. What people don't realize, though, is that when the Titanic sank, the world was a totally different place. It was a highly stratified society. Mm -hmm. So if you were in third class, i.e. steerage, you were poor, and you were an immigrant, mostly, and you were coming over to America from Ireland or someplace like that, or, or Eastern Europe, and you were going to work, and you didn't count. Yeah. Whereas if you were an Aster, you did count. Yeah. And there's a huge difference. There was no labor unions. People that worked that came over here were machines. They were they were employed in mills and mines and stuff. And if you died on the job, you know, give your wife twenty bucks and kick mm. her out of the company house. Yeah. So that's how stratified our society was. So if you came over here they didn't even consider the people in steerage much more than cattle. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, if you were an aster, you were an aster. Yeah. If you were in steerage, you were just as good as a cow. And what happened was, as Carpathia is pulling these people one by one out of the water, as soon as they got aboard Carpathia, first class was sent to one section of the ship, second to another, <laughs> third class to another, and they were all treated by different doctors. The American doctor treated the first class. I can't remember second class, but a Hungarian doctor treated the third class. Not that people really didn't need treatment. They actually gave them a quick shot of brandy, and they had some uh, sandwiches, and they had warmed up towels in the kitchen, and uh, blankets in the kitchen. And there was not a great need for first aid, but they were attended to, but they were immediately in that stratified situation again. So. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here just real quick. I do have my book for sale today. It's the Down East listed for 15.95.
I charge 15 just because making change is easier. I do take checks and I have a little cash to make change and there's a lot of folks here so uh, I'll, I'm sticking around just as long as I need to. So, uh, But I always wind it up this way. I won't give you the stink eye as you leave if you don't buy my book simply because I appreciate the fact that you all came here today and this has been a really good talk so thank you.